Hello, and welcome to The Shakedown, where we discuss the criminal justice system from the inside out. The goal of this podcast is to explain how the criminal justice system works from policing to courts to prison to parole and how they affect all of us. The hosts of The Shakedown draw from personal experience and share their stories. Our hosts include Malone, who spent 30 years in Texas prisons and is now a published comic book artist. Dave has been in and out of prisons for most of his life and is a proud dad. Both have traveled the country speaking about their experience with Texas prisons. My name is Ryan, a.k.a. Rainforest, and I spent six years in Texas prisons during which time I studied sociology, criminology, and writing. I now live up in Colorado, where I help with local projects to help those struggling in the community. And now, here's our show. like to introduce yourself and talk a bit about what you do in your and your podcast. Yeah. Hi, I'm Heather. I am the host of Hot Mess Espresso. It is a mental health podcast. We started off, me and my multiple just sides to myself, but I say we, it's just me. Um, started off educating on borderline personality disorder and just kind of trying to humanize it and educate people on what it is, what it is not, stuff like that. And it's just kind of turned into more of a mental health all around. We, we've we had quite a few different people on talking about um, different topics with mental health that, you know, should be talked about more. Um, we've had people talking about postpartum anxiety, um, you know, just their own mental health journeys and stuff like that. And it's been, it's been pretty incredible. Very cool. Yeah. That's um, something that's definitely uh, lacking in prison, in Texas prison yes. system. Yeah. It's lacking everywhere, but I, I feel like that would be one of the one of the bigger places it's lacking. It's lacking in Texas in general. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely it is. That's why whenever you said Huntsville, we all thought you were going to a prison. I mean, I mean Huntsville is like... Uh, no. <laughs> Huntsville is associated with prisons in general. Yeah, I think I, I, yeah, for sure. That and the college. That's about it. That and the college. The college is associated with mental illness too? <laughs> no, no, just the town. <laughs> just. <laughs> probably. I mean, I literally, some of the worst years of my life was in college, so probably. <laughs> Well, as you say, around the country, like the the biggest um, place where people with mental illness go, which tends to be jails and prisons in general, Mm -hmm. which and which is really sad that it ends up being there's no they don't really deal with the issue. They just house them and that's it. Well, that's just the system in general, from what I understand of it. They just you're there and then you're out and there's no any kind of anything no aftercare well, that's, exactly you know, so, that's that's the word i was like i, I don't want to say like rehabilitation <laughs> but i was like i don't know the word <laughs> so it's a, a i can a prime example of that was there was a guy who where ryan and i were on a trusty camp and there was a guy that i worked with in the kitchen who we called him light bulb for lack of better words and me and this guy worked side by side for i don't know six months or so and so i get out and i'm working the door working security for a bar and this guy's homeless walking down the street and I see him and I'm like, I'm looking at him and he's walking up and I'm like, and he gets up close to me. And I was like, damn, that's a light bulb. And I was like, look out light bulb. And he had no recollection of who I was and he was completely out of it. And, you know, as it turns out, talking to him later again is, you know, he wasn't on any kind of medication because they didn't provide him with anything except what he left the prison with, which was whatever he had left, you know? Yeah. And it's crazy because he was completely lucid, normal, you know, for, or appeared normal anyways, I should say, Mm -hmm. however, but uh, no, he wasn't, And you know, again, you know, it's lacquer, no aftercare. Yeah. It's not, I, it's not like they set them up with 
psychology or psychiatry after or make sure that they stay up on their meds or any kind of treatment after the fact for sure and that's a huge problem you know, for a second, I thought Probably, this was going to be an I intervention feel... when I saw you. <laughs> thought they brought you on to try to convince me I needed help. <laughs> Turn myself in. <laughs> oh my god! No, no, no! I don't, I don't really do that convincing. That's going to be another we know you need help. alone. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. We got you. Next but no, week. I feel like um, a lack of mental health aftercare contributes to the recidivism rate as well. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, I absolutely agree. There's a lot of things we assume that when something, you know, someone like their breaks law or does something that is considered a crime and then we just put them away for a while and then they get back out on the street that that's going to yeah. magically prevent the thing from happening again. And we're not yeah. going to give them – it's not like we give them a whole lot of tools either when they're locked up to do yeah. something different or learn or figure out a new path because it's it's hard. It's hard to learn something, a new way to deal um, with – like um, um, do you talk about like coping skills and mental health strategies on, on your show or things we like do. that? Or, yeah. We do. Um, I actually, in a few future episodes, we're um, going to be talking with um, a couple of people that uh, work on like somatic healing, energy healing, but also how to manage stress in the workplace and um, coping strategies with that and, you know, stuff like that. We're still expanding with the podcast, but that was a huge thing that while, while I'm not a therapist and I'm not a substitute for mental health treatment, I'd like to be a gateway to helping people kind of figure out ways to cope with things because mental health in general is not very accessible right now to anybody. It is absolutely a privilege and it shouldn't be that way. That's true. I, I agree with you, but do you think some, that some people are afraid to ask for the help as well? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I'm very, very open about my mental health journey and my struggles. And even then I still get people that are like, okay, you've talked about this enough. Like shut the hell up. And it's just, you know, people don't want to necessarily hear it. They want to hear, oh, I'm doing okay. I'm all right. They want to hear vague. They want to hear this. They hear that. But then there's certain jobs where if you get mental health help, it's kind of like a black mark or like a blacklist on your jacket or something like case in point. I know that it's really difficult for people in the military to access mental health help, which they all should be, but right. because <laughs> you know, the, the shit that they see, like you, you, somebody's gotta be looking at that. Um, so, they really can't access the help because, you know, they may not be able to get deployed. They may not be able to, you know, do this, that, or the third. And it, cause they're all, Oh, get help, get help, get help. But, but also don't get help. And that's kind of how it is overall. Like if you actually get help for what you, what you do, what you're dealing with, what you're seeing, whether it's, you know, first responders, people that have gone through a ton of trauma, it's also at the same time, well, don't, don't do that because, you know, we just want to, we just want to kind of put it under the rug. And I have a huge problem with that, obviously. Oh yeah, I do too. But it's, it, but that seems to be the norm, you know, mm -hmm. and then people also want to put their own mental health issues, you know, sweep them under the rug as well. Cause they don't want anybody to think they're different. And I never thought about that. Like you said, in the workplace to where it could impede like, you know, career advancement or things like that mm -hmm. but yeah i mean any kind of high stress job or environment you should be talking to a therapist and not only is it kind of unofficially frowned upon it's hard to access because it's expensive and the cost of being alive these days is astronomical so you know it's either pay my rent or go to therapy and you know, insurance, insurances are a whole other, if you have insurance, it's a whole other, you know, trying to find a therapist that works with your insurance. And, you know, if you're going through the state for mental health help, 
there's only a certain amount of time that you can be accessing therapy before they kick you out because the state, a lot of states are just like, okay, well, after two years, like you should be good to go. And it's like, no, if you're dealing with a lot of complex trauma and a lot of things that kind of keep happening, it's going to take more than two years to unpack that shit. <laughs> A lot of, in prison, a lot of guys I know too, they, it's like, they, it becomes a pride issue too. Like they become, it's a huge, like if they, it like whatever they say, it has to be right. They're right. They know what they're talking about. And even the idea that they're talking like the con, like if you're questioning their, like what they would consider their sanity or with, or how much they know, like Mm -hmm. that becomes a huge deal. And even the few programs that exist in prisons, they honestly, a lot of times they'll reaffirm that. They'll double down in, um, like, there's authentic manhood classes, which are meant to be like, you're supposed to be the man and you're supposed to be the person who, um, like, runs the household and takes care of this and takes care of that. So, like, then it becomes like, you need to have an iron fist and you need to know exactly what you're talking about when it comes to all these things. And that makes it makes a bad problem far worse if there's any sort of mental health problem, which there they clearly are going to be coming right out fresh out of prison. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're coming out of a literal institution into the free world where things are not as regimented. You have more free will X, Y, Z. I feel like that would kind of screw with you a little bit, but to add to what you were saying, um, I'm, I'm not a guy, so I don't understand mental men's mental health fully, but I do have a lot of, um, I guess colleagues that are in that their podcasts are about men's mental health and stuff. And you hear that a lot that men are supposed to be tough. Men aren't supposed to show emotion. Men aren't supposed to this men aren't supposed to that. And that compounds on the whole don't ask for help because you've got this, you have to handle this. And I think that also that kind of twisted, I guess, toxic mentality also contributes to the mental health issue and why they're not asking for help and why they're not because they're, then they're seen as weak or they're seen as, you know, the opposite of what asking for help is, which is you're actually being really brave for saying, I can't handle this right now. I need to figure out a way to handle this so I can be a better person. So I can be a better father, husband, son, uncle, whatever. And I just, I don't understand why we haven't like come to that conclusion yet. I, I don't quite understand that either. Why that was one of the first things, like I was fortunate enough to actually go to addiction treatment. And that was one yeah. of the first things I had to break down was because everyone, as soon as they come in, they're like, no, I need to talk to my family. No, I need to, to reach out to this. No, I'm taking care of this person. Like, no, you're in treatment. You're in the you emergency room. You. Right. Yeah. This is your time right now. Work on that. Then you can worry about other people way down the line. I mean, because exactly. bottom line, if you can't fix yourself, how are you going to fix it or, or, you know, help anybody else? Exactly. Right. No, the thing with addiction is I know, like, I'm sure it's a little different now because I, I haven't done my research on it lately. But I know that, like, the big thing was when they started coming out with dual diagnosis treatment centers and stuff like that, where they were actually finally treating the underlying trauma that usually comes with addiction instead of just trying to get somebody clean and send them out the door. They actually started working on the mental health and the trauma and, you know, all the reasons why somebody becomes addicted to something because nobody wakes up and goes, I'm going to be addicted to X, Y, Z. There's, it's usually, there's usually a reason. So the fact that, um, you were lucky enough to go to, and so were, were you a, was it, I can't talk today. Was it more of a dual diagnosis where they were working on your mental health or was it just working on the addiction? Well, it, the the treatment center I went to, which I highly recommend, it's Cedar. It's the Colorado um, Dependent and Addiction Recovery, I believe that's the acronym, but Cedar in Colorado. Um, they're great. Um, they mm-hmm. basically, so to get me in there, so I I had just, um, I just killed someone in a drunk driving accident and 
I and I basically um, my lawyer and my parents are like, you need to go to this place. And mm-hmm. I'm talking to them on the phone. And I'm like, I am not an alcoholic. Um, and they're like, that's all. All right. You you may you may not be an alcoholic. That's fine. You might not be. But you probably have abused substances. I'm like, all right, fair enough. Like, I, I can accept right. that. And then the way they broke it down was they then once you're in there, then they're it's from every angle. They're trying to they really they do. Fo- it is focused on addiction as like kind of like the the, the backbone of everything. Mm-hmm. But they are working on mental health and general coping skills and and everything and like once i was kind of like okay i need to be here this is something i want to learn everything i can from this place it was it was skills these were overall skills you could learn you could apply for whatever you're dealing with they were things you could um apply for your day-to-day life regardless and then they did have people who could um diagnose other like um they had trauma counselors they had okay. um, people who specialized in different sorts of disorders and, and compulsions and things like that. Mm-hmm. So if you did have like different issues that were coinciding or like go- coinciding with the addiction, they would have people there for you so you could start working on there from on that and then move if like once you were done, because generally it was a 30 to 90 day program. Mm-hmm. You would graduate, and then you could go out into the, out, and have a counselor and everything outside of there. But that's how it definitely should be. I mean, you have to work on the underlying and the coping and stuff like that because it's so easy to be strong in a facility where you don't have the outside influences. But once you're once you're out out there, the possibilities are endless, kind of thing. You're safe when you're in in treatment. Exactly. You know, because you're around other people that are at least making the effort to try and get better or putting on a show, but at least, you know, they're making, they look like they're trying to get better right. and we'll say they are, they're all trying to better themselves. But then when mm-hmm. you get out, you know, like, I mean, I've run into people like I used to know and, you know, and they're all still, some of them are still doing the same things they were, but it's mm-hmm. like, you know, people are going to just, they don't care really. You know, a lot of people don't about your mental well being Cause if you're not, no. you know, like, my old friends are like, I'm not Mr. Party Fun Guy, so they don't want to hang around. Yeah, God forbid you become a, like, you can still party and be, like, a good human being. The partying True. just looks a little different. You're talking about, you get out and it's just like, you know, you go from being incarcerated to being mm-hmm. free. And there's no transition, there's no going yeah. to, you know, wherever, you just get out. And I got out and a friend picked me up and we went to a Bucky's. I don't know if you went to a Bucky's while you're here in Texas. I did not. But, no. Oh, you, you that, missed that out. That is for the next trip. That is that is on the list for the next trip. Make it a pilgrimage. It's worth it. No, I don't know if it's worth it, but it. they're 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 huge. So I went to Bucky's and I'm like, I walk in, it's like I don't know about ten in the morning, and it's just people everywhere, and I'm like just tripping. I just stopped, and my friend Juan was like, "What?" and I was like. There's just so many people. And it was just, you know, I'd been gone for a little, about four and a half years. And it was just so strange to be around all those people just doing what they normally do. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're in a bubble, a very yeah. regimented bubble. And oh, then a doubt. it's like, here's the free world. Have fun. And yeah, you're just like, do it. I don't, what? <laughs> do your thing now. Yeah. Like you've done your time, you've served your sentence, mazel. Yeah. yeah, six years in in prison, and then the day I got out was in the middle of pan, of a pandemic. I oh, caught God. a plane to to Colorado. Like, oh, yeah, I talked so, to you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You I, ate salmon at the airport. <laughs> right, exactly. It was crazy. That that day was the craziest day. I had a full on um, prison beard, and then going through the airport with a mask on, and then flying out to Colorado. All like that was the most sensory overload I've ever had in 24 imagine. hours. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I'm... it's crazy. It's a trip. Yeah. I'm... You know, and, and, and you even talk about mental health too. It's like, so I've been dealing with just a lot of like stress lately, just, mm-hmm. just with life being life. Right. And, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. you know, and I can, 
I can really empathize with people who, you know, I, and I can, I get why some people are just like, you know, the heck with it, the hell that I'm just going to go back to doing what I'm doing because I can't make it this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. And it's just the stressors. It's like, you know, just life being life. It's like paying bills and just taking care of everything and trying to, you know, uh, manage your time so I could spend time with everybody that I want to spend time with and still get everything done that I need to get done. Mm-hmm. And I always feel like I'm behind and I can, you know, and it stresses me out and I can see how some people just, you know, they, there's like the heck with it. I don't, I don't care anymore. I, you know, I'm just going back to prison. Well, not, not literally saying that to themselves, but like, I'm going to go back to doing they don't what care I'm if doing. They go or not. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, with proper, mental health that could give them the tools to actually you know know how to deal with those thoughts as they come exactly and I think um and again I'm just kind of these are just my opinions um but yeah like you were saying it's it's familiar they know what to do what to think there versus out here there's there's a ton going on oh yeah and even if you're you know whether you've been incarcerated or not it's incredibly stressful so I cannot imagine what it's like to go from that bubble to back out here and it's like shit I have bills like what if what you know yeah. or you know just this? like <laughs> yeah exactly like you just go from being very right I it's almost I don't I don't know what the term is but I I can imagine going from super it's going from super regimented to not you want to go back to the super regimented because it's comfortable it's it's safe. Like, you know what to, you know what to do there. So much of your thinking is done for you there. You know, you don't have to. Exactly. Yeah. And, and not there, they don't have any, they have no responsibilities other than, you know, going to, going to commissary, mm-hmm. you know, Very few responsibilities. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I didn't have any, I didn't have a job. The, the person that I, th- I think of a lot, like we, we've we talked, Ben David's been on the show and he's, uh, <laughs> he's a great example of, oh my God. of like the, the, someone who could definitely benefit from mental health services um, inside of prison because what happens is he has, like he can, he has seeking behaviors and mm-hmm. does not like, he knows exactly what to do inside prison and then knows exactly what, and then gets out and then still continues it. And there's no, there's nothing for him. There's no benefit inside or out. Like there's nothing that's to, for him to like change that um, behavior or to, or or reason to change it or Mm -hmm. anything like there's, there's people like Malone and I, and even Dave, I think at certain points I've been like, you know, trying to like try to help him and he is like he's he's got a heart of gold he's he's the most likable person in the world and but he like there there's a part of him that is like he cannot stop using and there's that's that's the idea of addiction you're you know the whole powerlessness against it is the you know uh i mean from what i understand about it uh, uh Addic- I mean, it's a, there's a, there's literally a chemical uh, uh, situation going on inside of their heads mm-hmm. that is telling them that I mean, giving them this overwhelming urge to to, to, to have this substance over and over and all, you know, all day long. They don't have if if they're not on it, well then they all they can think about is getting it. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's too powerful for for uh, an individual to overcome. I mean, you just gotta you gotta think about it from their terms. Well, and coming from personal experience, um, even if even if you try to get off of it, sometimes those withdrawals are so bad that you're like, you know what, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna stay on this shit because I I had uh, it was it was it was a prescribed oxy that turned into an addiction because I was on it for so long, and getting off of that. I remember looking at my mom and going, I can understand why people stay on this now, because honestly, I don't think I want to get off this anymore because it was, it was horrible. Those withdrawals were awful. So, and, and I mean, even to this day, I've been 
off of them for, I got off them when I was 20, so 12 years. And I was, I was in the, it was, I, I was just determined. I had seen my godfather uh, pass away from a pill addiction from three spinal surgeries, same as me. So when I hit that third one, I was like, nope, nope. Cause I, I saw it. I was like, I can't, but, but I also, my mentality was different, I guess. And so like, I can sympathize with people that are stuck in active addiction because I know how freaking tough it is to get off of that stuff. But then you know, even 12 years later, I was in, um, in the hospital for a few days for a double kidney infection and they gave me oxy and I was only on it for three days. And I was like, three days, I should be good. I should be fine. I should, nope. Woke up sweating, shaking migraine. I was like, son of a bitch. (laughs) And it's just like that. So I, I know how like just addicted your body, it's not even your mind, it's your body. Your body's like, ooh, we remember this stuff. We like this stuff. And your head's just like, no, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> and it's it's hard. Yeah, that stuff starts talking to you. It gets in your head and next mm-hmm. thing you know, all is, it's, it's, it's communicating to you, telling you, all it's telling you is how you can get more. <laughs> yeah. And like I had had a surgery and they, they gave me oxy and I was just like, I'll just take one. And I took the one and my, you know, you get that little, the little hit of serotonin and you're like, shit. I was like, I literally, my sister took the rest of them out of the house. I was like, I don't want to know where they are. I don't want to see them. Like, mm -mm, we're not going down this road again. Like, I can't do it because it's just, it's, it's just like that. So I can completely understand. But I actually have a, um, a question for you guys, just because we are talking mental health. What, what was the access to it? It like, depending on what, obviously I, I don't know how, like, in depth you guys go just yet on like your stories but um what was the access to mental health there was it just seeing like a counselor and getting on meds if you needed it or you can find shakedown merch graphic novels and other projects at waywardpress.com that's w-a-y-w-o-r-d press.com if you would like to support the shakedown get exclusive content and watch episodes live you can support us at patreon.com slash the shakedown like subscribe and leave a comment to give malone that inner peace he so richly deserves